Pints with Jack, Season 3, Episode 8. Till We Have Faces, Part 1, Chapters 10 and 11, Psyche's Palace. Good morning, and welcome to Pints with Jack, a podcast where two enthusiastic C.S. Lewis amateurs get together, share a beverage, and discuss the work of C.S. Lewis. This season, we're reading Till We Have Faces. My name is David, and I'm joined by Matt, the Flying Dutchman Bush. <laughs> as you were, as I was prepping, well, prepping, as I was sitting here five minutes before you said that, I was wondering, what does TFD stand for? That's all David gives me in our notes, listeners. And so I, I wait in great anticipation to see what nickname he's going to provide me every single week. Well, I just figured you're from Holland, so the Flying Dutchman. You know what they say? If you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. <laughs> What's your drink of the week? Well, I am starting something for the next 90 days where I can't drink alcohol. Uh, are you doing Exodus 90? I am in preparation for Easter. Thus, I am drinking honey, lavender, herbal tea. Well, I'm also having tea today. I'm having a hibiscus tea. I hope we don't have a lot of listeners that, as much as they enjoy our drinks of the week, only listen to us for that because it's going to be a disappointing 90 days. Well, I'll, I'll carry the team. I'll make sure I have some good stuff over the next 90 days. Good, and I expect you to drink double for me. <laughs> What's the quote of the week? Quote of the week is going to be from the second chapter. And while this isn't directly in the quote itself, this quote it, leading up to this earlier in the chapter, she essentially says, this is her biggest complaint against the gods. And so this is a pretty big quote, and we'll unpack more of this in the chapter itself. But I chose, the world had broken in pieces, and Psyche and I were not in the same piece. Seas, mountains, madness, death itself could not have removed her from me to such a hopeless distance as this. Gods, and again gods, always gods, they had stolen her. So with that, cheers. Cheers. I have learned to love tea, David. You would be proud of me. I feel like I <laughs> could survive in the land of the Brits. I'm pleased to hear it. Well, I have bad news as we start off this conversation. Devastating news. Uh-huh. Just terrible. I mean, I hope you're ready for this. I did not see Little Women. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> I was going to ask you what you thought of it. And now I can't. I mean, I guess with Exodus 90, you get one thing back a week. So in theory, if I take movie back a week, I can go see it. But I, I don't know if that's what I'm going to use it on or not. So You're just not that cultured. <laughs> I know. This is going to set me back big time. Well, actually, in other sad news, I saw today that Christopher Tolkien just died. Aw. So that's, so that's the son of J.R.R. So may you rest in peace. Is there any person? I mean, Christopher Tolkien, I knew his name. Is there, is it getting too diluted now or is there anyone that feels close to Tolkien or is that really the last line that, that somewhat carried the torch? I'm pretty sure he still has other siblings who are alive. Okay. He's just important because he was the one who looked after his father's work and got the unpublished tales out there. Mm. Oh, well, that's a sad day. Oh, well, let's hope he's in a better place. Mm. We need to cheer this up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's slightly happy news. Uh, this past week, we had our first book club meeting here in San Diego, where we're going through Till We Have Faces. And uh, in our group, we had quite a few insights and comments that I just thought were just worth highlighting. Several people said that they didn't think that the fox really knew how limited he is. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. Uh, somebody referred to Redival as the classic middle child. <laughs> Easy what you say there, David. I'm the middle child. Well, yeah. Classic middle child, you mean incredibly wise and the mature one in the family that rises up and keeps peace with everyone? Must be that. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, and it was also commented that she must have had some kind of identity crisis when Psyche came along because she lost what made her special. She had always been the beautiful one, but now Psyche's beauty outshines hers. Yeah, I would say that's true. Several people asked, why is the king so useless at his job? <laughs> you know, what, what is his backstory? Why is he so utterly dependent upon the fox? Surely he'd have been trained in this stuff since he was young. And somebody else commented that it must have actually been very hard for the king to rely on Oriole when the fox was sick, to basically admit that his daughter was better at something than he was. Yeah, these are fair points. But my favorite point that came up again in a number of different ways 
in reference to this book, people described it as the difference between the Old and the New Testament, as God's face becomes clearer in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, and people pointed at things like uh, the necessity of sacrifice, that what the gods actually wanted was a, a kind of a right living, kind of like Hosea, you know, I don't ask for sacrifice, um, I want knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And it was also brought up, the incident on Mars Hill. You remember in Acts of the Apostles when St. Paul comes to Athens and he goes to Mars Hill and he sees all of these different altars to all of these different gods. And he says, I see you're all very religious, but I see an altar over there that's to the unknown God. I have come to proclaim that God to you. The idea that a lot of people in the group felt was that they were worshipping what they didn't know. In this story, the people of Gloam, they're worshipping what they don't really know. And they need somebody to come and tell them what it is that they're actually worshipping. That's related to the question I want to say I asked a couple weeks ago to you, where is there a chance in here that Lewis with all of this is somewhat trying to communicate that we might be missing the mark on things? And I appreciate your answer, but I'm just saying that's maybe he's trying to explain that we don't fully know everything and we're doing the best we can with what we know, but there are things we're missing and it'll be revealed to us probably after the side of life. I'm not saying that's what it is, but that question popped into my mind. And actually related to that, we had a message from Scott Cunningham. He, he wanted to point out something that we, you and I had talked about. Do you want to read that message? Yeah, I really appreciated this. I cannot wait until we get the Slack channel going and we get more listeners sharing their views because we don't know everything. He had said, Hi guys, I've just begun listening to your podcast and am enjoying catching up with your experience and analysis of Till We Have Faces. This is one of my all-time favorite books and one that has had a profound impact on my life. Man, I'd love for him to expand on that. that would, I, I, I want us to reply to that and get more there. I wanted to comment on one aspect of the book that I think you guys are missing a bit, and that is the treatment of pagan faith in the book. You guys have tended to be a bit perplexed by how extreme the cult of Unget seems, like in the creepy wooden masks her attendants wear. I believe the creepiness is actually how Lewis is communicating the holiness and otherness and how far beyond man the gods are. And he is following this trail from a basic understanding that paganism isn't anti-Christian, but is pre-Christian. I can't remember if it was in The God of the Dock or The Abolition Man, where he discussed how much of improvement it would be in our society if they sacrificed a bull to open parliament. I think that Lewis's depictions of Ungit's cult is along those lines. I really appreciated that. That is very lewis in general, he takes that from Chesterton. Chesterton talks about how paganism would be the only other thing he would choose alternatively to Christianity because he thought that they got something right, which was this creation is beautiful and should be held up in reverence and honor, but they just went too extreme. Christianity saved paganism from itself, and Lewis was very influenced by Chesterton. So it would not shock me for a second if this was something that Lewis would be uh, playing on. Yeah, and I went and tracked down what he was referring to. And it's from Is Theology Important?, which indeed can be found in God in the Dock. This is a section. When grave persons express their fear that England is relapsing into paganism, I am tempted to reply, would that she were. For I do not think it at all likely that we shall ever see Parliament opened by the slaughtering of a garland white bull in the House of Lords, or cabinet ministers leaving sandwiches in Hyde Park as an offering for the dryads. If such a state of affairs came about, then the Christian apologist would have something to work on, for a pagan, as history shows, is a man eminently convertible to Christianity. He is essentially the pre-Christian or sub-Christian religious man. The post-Christian man of our day differs from him as much as a divorcee differs from a virgin. The Christian and the pagan have much more in common with one another than either has with the writers of the New Statesman. That was a, a magazine. And those writers would, of course, agree with me. So what do you have anything to expand on his point to maybe communicate it or um, expound on it a little bit further? His point that it's communicating the holiness and otherness and how far beyond man the gods are? I think he's just showing that paganism to Christianity is a natural stepping stone. And in the history of Christianity, the place where you, you see the faith explode is in the lands which have been prepared by paganism. I like that. Yeah, thank you so much. 
Yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, yeah, listeners, keep the feedback coming. This stuff's really good. I would have never have read this essay otherwise. And Scott, look out for an email from us because I want to learn more about how it's impacted your life. And that we probably won't share on the podcast. <laughs> well, certainly not if how it impacted him is that he too offered his sister on a mountain to a brute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, David Bates, the way your mind thinks. Mm. <laughs> So, listeners, if you recall, we actually, did we cheers? I don't think we cheers. I think we did. We did. I know we did. We did. I, we did. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm on it, David. Crisis averted. So, listeners, if you recall, we left Bardia and Orwell on the mountain, looking across the stream and seeing Psyche. Here's my summary for chapter 10. Cue that music. While Bardia is afraid, Orwell is overjoyed to see Psyche, who invites her to cross the stream. Psyche once again is the one who comforts Oriol and gives her berries and water, which she describes as food fit for the gods. Psyche tells her story of being painted and drugged, taken up the mountain, chained to the tree, and lamented over by the king. When everyone leaves, she cries, and animals gather around her. At the moment when she has lost all hope, the wind changes, bringing the rain. She sees the west wind himself, and he takes her to the hidden valley where unseen voices welcome her, the bride of the god, to her new home. The voices bathe and feed her, after which the god comes to her. Orwell asks to see this palace, and is shocked to hear that they have been on its steps the entire time. We're about to get into some interesting stuff here. I feel like we're progressing from themes. So a big thing that I've picked up on, and I'm oversimplifying things, there's been a lot we've talked about, but longing has been a big role of this. I think we're about to progress into seeing versus perceiving. And what does it mean for our our hearts to be oriented towards being able to actually perceive what we're seeing? And you think of the scripture first that Jesus says, when he says, those who have eyes do not see sometimes. And you're seeing that here with Orwell versus Psyche. And what's the difference? Why does one see and why does one not? That's a question that's been on my mind. But without further ado, let's get to chapter, see if we can't get some answers. Yeah, it all begins with the reactions of Bardia and Orwell. Bardia is afraid. He thinks that Psyche might be a ghost. And um, he's kind of terrified. And uh, Orwell says that she couldn't blame him. She described Psyche as being bright face, as they say in the Greek. And from this, this is the first hint that we get that there has been some kind of transformation of Psyche. And... When I, particularly when I read the word bright face, I couldn't help but think of Moses and Christ, who also undergo a kind of transformation, and also both on mountaintops, Sinai and the Mount of Transfiguration. And Psyche says that seeing Orwell has been the only thing that she's been longing for, kind of implying that all other longings have been satisfied. And she invites Orwell across the stream, and only Orwell. Bardia is totally okay with that, saying he's only a soldier. He's clearly very scared. And in the last episode, I compared the stream to the great divorce, to the fountain that we hear about in the episode with the artistic ghost. But given that she's now crossing over to meet somebody who we thought had died, I actually thought the river Styx from Greek mythology was probably be a bit more fitting. There is something in here in this scene that I want us to expand upon later, so I don't for sake of time, not go too much into here. But that transformation you're talking about a second ago reminded me a lot of Theosis. And we haven't talked about that here, but now that she's she's in communion with the gods, as we've talked about a lot before, a transformation happens within us. The closer we get to that here on earth, the more transformation happens. It might not be quite as physical, but I still think it is. You know, you meet those people who 10 years go by, they've really... Di- gotten into their faith, they've they've entered into communion with God, they're so much closer, and you say, something's different about this person. They exude a holiness, a radiance almost. That's what was going through my mind in this scene. And so I, I want to talk more about that on the YouTube video. So for listeners, go check out the channel. There's a little plug for that. But there's 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 some stuff I think we can unpack there and a good reminder in our own Christian journeys. In both of these chapters, I thought again and again about the great divorce. Yes. So even as she's crossing the stream, uh, she thinks that she's still weak from her convalescence. Uh, but she talks about the coldness of the water shocked the breath out of me. The current was so strong that basically if Psyche hadn't been holding her hand, she'd have knocked her over. 
which is almost exactly what happens to Lewis in The Great Divorce. And she even notes that Psyche seems to be so much stronger than she was before, and a little bit later that she seems taller. So it seems like The Great Divorce that things in this land are harder, they're more substantial, they're more real. Yes, very similar. And I also liked how in the same way in The Great Divorce, these more substantial spirits helped the ghosts. Psyche helped her across. That that idea of those that are in communion who have become more substantial, turn around and help those that are not. And I, I just loved that all throughout this later. We'll see when she talks about imploring the gods to to help Orwell on this journey. I mean, that's just such a beautiful thing. Once you have it, you want to bring others with you. It's that Pope Francis joy of the gospel. You can't help but wanting to spread this and bring others. And in this next section, I've often thought as we've been reading through this, I think this will make a good movie. I don't know. I've got to wait until I get to the end to make a categorical decision. But if this were a movie, I think the scene that follows would probably be replayed twice or maybe with flashbacks because we discover that each sister is experiencing this land very differently. From Oral's point of view, they go and sit down in some heather and Psyche feeds her some berries and gives her a drink of water using her own hands as a cup. But from Psyche's point of view... They have come to her palace, where Orwell has been fed with honey cakes and wine in a precious cup. And you said you had seen The Sixth Sense after you met Shyamalan, right? Yes. Yeah. And I thought, much like the movie The Sixth Sense, when we go back and reread this chapter, after we find out that they've been experiencing the same events very differently, things that Psyche says start to become clearer. Uh, she acts like a hostess when Orwell first comes, you know, saying, welcome, welcome. She said she'd been on my threshold. Um, she describes the food as fit for the gods. When she gives Orwell what Orwell perceives as being water, she says, have you ever tasted nobler wine or in a fairer cup? And even Orwell describes her as being like a queen or a hostess giving gifts. And Psyche says when Orwell wants to leave, she says, where will we be safe if not here? This is my home. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because to begin with, Orwell just peppers her with questions. She wants to know... Where have you lived? How did you escape? What do we do now? Uh, And Psyche responds to that last question with the same question that Orwell had heard in her heart as they were going up the mountain. She says, be merry. Why should our hearts not dance? (laughs) That jumped out to me, especially since that's what we talked about on the YouTube video. That's what we talked about on the blog. You see the opposite example here. You see Orwell resisting that and you see psyche embracing it she can she's actually able to experience the grace and the gift of merriment from the gods whereas orwell cannot and it's just another example of the gulf that's growing between them that distancing it was really beautiful to see her say that i was so happy but you do also see a little bit of a mary martha dynamic going on (laughs) yes And also you have Psyche once again being the one that's comforting Orwell. Psyche, who was the one who was sacrificed, she's the one that's now comforting her sister. And she says that she wants to make Orwell happy and she won't stop until she is. And all the while, Orwell wants to make plans. (laughs) And so Psyche teases her, solemn Orwell, you are always one for plans. I think think Orwell is definitely a type A, which is probably why she was such a great queen later. (laughs) David, you have a problem with type A's? Not at all. Type A's are my favorite kinds of people. (laughs) Good. (laughs) But Psyche, she starts telling the story of her adventure. She says that the two temple girls who came to her room, they gave her some kind of drugged beverage to drink, and it it sort of had a dreamy effect on her. Um, And they then painted her face, and she said that had a similar kind of effect. She says... It made my face stiff till it didn't seem like my own face. Till we have faces. So she says that she didn't feel like she was herself. She says, I couldn't feel that it was I who was being sacrificed. I found it interesting here how she began talking about this as dream nightmare versus waking up. Yeah. And it just made me think so much of spiritual journeys in general. You can almost classify a spiritual journey or characterize it as a process of waking up. As we mature in our journey, 
it's amazing when I look back five years ago at my own life, how differently I view things, how I think to myself, how did I even think that was acceptable? How did I think that's how the world worked? It seems so obvious to me now, but I was so asleep then. I was, you're almost sleepwalking through life and taking what the world tells you as truth, as truth. But then when you start to open your mind and go on this journey, it begins to unfold in a different way and you see the beauty of creation and truth in such a different light. And that's what I got here. Yeah. Yeah. Psyche says that she's woken up and she's going to wake up Oroel too. And that, that whole motif, it, again, it reminded me of the great divorce, the comparison between life in the gray town and life in the foothills of heaven. It's only when you get there that you realize that what you were living in before were the shadow lands. Yes. Great way of describing it. Only when you get there do you realize that. And it's, it's, isn't it really frustrating once you're there? And I don't mean this in some arrogant ways if I'm there. I'm more there than I was five years ago. I will probably 10 years from now look back and say I wasn't even remotely close to there now. But you look back and there's people you know that you love that might be a little bit earlier in the journey. Nothing right or wrong about that. And you want to explain to them that oh, that's just not going to bring you the happiness and joy you're desiring. But it's so hard because until you've experienced it, you can't understand it. And it's really hard to explain things. It's like that saying, those who know, no explanation is necessary. Those who don't know, no explanation will suffice. Mm -hmm. It's tough. I would say it's kind of the difference between analytical and experiential knowledge. Yes. Oh. Boom, David. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there was one little section that I did just want to briefly mention. Uh, Psyche says that when she started to come to herself again, once this drug was starting to wear off, she said that uh, a great bird-headed man or a bird with a man's body, um, he basically told them to give her some more. And Oral comments, that would be the priest. And Psyche says, yes. If he is still the priest when he puts on his mask, perhaps he becomes a god while he wears it. This was one of those quotes that I, I, I'm curious what you're about to say here, because it was one where I know Lewis just communicated something, and I have no idea what he communicated, except it made me think of Mere Christianity, Let's Pretend chapter. That's it. Mm. Basically about the mask that we, conf- that we wear, it eventually forms the shape of our face. That's, that's what he says in Mere Christianity where he's alluding to some story. Yes. Yes. I'm just sensitive to anything where they talk about covering Mm -hmm. up people's faces, since this book is called (laughs) Till We Have Faces. And the other thing that occurred to me is it sort of seemed like a similar idea to the Christian idea of in persona Christi. The idea that when the priest is celebrating the sacraments, he is in the person of Christ. Basically, Jesus is borrowing his hands, his feet, his voice, in order to celebrate the sacraments. Interesting. I really want to hope that's what Lewis was communicating. Possibly. It is very possible. Would that be of something that was in the Anglican church at the time? Or, or maybe it still is, if an Anglican could be listening to this mad at me right now. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly, a, uh, there's certainly a stream of thought that I've encountered in the Anglican church that would recognize something like that. Uh, but I'm sure Andrew will be able to tell us since he is currently at seminary there. Oh, fantastic. Andrew, looking forward to the answer. <laughs> Another interesting little incident in her sacrifice is when she talks about the king she describes him as shrieking and wailing and tearing his hair and she says and you know Maya he actually looked at me really looked and it seemed to me that he was seeing me for the first time and this kind of backs up what the fox said about the king's affections not being wholly feigned and it does also make me wonder whether the king actually did change his opinion about Psyche as a result of seeing her at the tree in the earlier chapter we read that he's still going on about how Psyche was his favorite daughter and she was wonderful, etc. Maybe that wasn't just him being mean to Red of Alan Orwell. I mean, remember, Lewis believes that no one is ever truly fully gone until there is a point where that can happen, I guess, maybe, but in that last judgment. But this, I mean, even though the king seems like a terrible person, doesn't mean something can't move him. Yeah. Stir his heart. Yeah. And while the priest is being a bird while the king is being a loving father psyche is really trying to be brave like the greek heroines that she'd heard about in the last episode we spoke about iphigenia the girl who actually offered herself in sacrifice for her father and she's left alone she cries 
animals gather about her, which was a bit weird, but okay. And there then comes this moment when she just says that she lost all hope. And this rather reminded me, I can't remember who said it, but I remember hearing somebody giving a talk and they said that in all of Lewis's books, you find the cry from the cross. You know what Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I would suggest that this is probably this incident until we have faces. She says, at first I was trying to cheer myself with all that old dream of my gold and amber palace on the mountain and the God trying to believe it, but I couldn't believe it at all. I couldn't understand how I ever had. All that, all my old longings were clean gone. The one thing I want to add to that, only because it's a subject that I've had some interesting conversations with a friend on who doesn't listen to this podcast. So, <laughs> but he's talked to, You can say what you I want. I know, exactly. But he's talked about cre- almost creating a theology around the idea that God abandoned Jesus on the cross. And I said how dangerous that is. And also when I started doing some digging in, my intuitive things came up with answers, but when I really got it, that expression is the beginning of Psalm 122, I think. 22. 22, there we go. And it's classic biblical thing where it's pointing you there, and then the rest of the psalm, when you read it out, it's it's definitely not a, a psalm of a God abandoning someone. And so... It's basically about God vindicating his servant by the end. Yes, there we go. So I, I wanted to say that, so some, any listener doesn't think, oh my God, yeah, God maybe thinks that God did actually forsaken Jesus Christ. There are some theologies that do try and say that, like there was a rupture in the Trinity. Uh, I don't think that makes sense. Otherwise, the Father and the Son haven't been in an eternal communion of love. Yes, I agree. Now I can imagine the, f- the feeling of abandonment as another matter entirely. <laughs> now, while Oral has this moment, she says that she holds on to something. I wasn't quite sure what she was pointing to even she says that she's not explaining it well she said it was hardly a thought and very hard to put into words there was a lot of the fox's philosophy in it things he says about gods or the divine nature but mixed up with the things the priest said too about the blood and the earth and about how sacrifice makes the crops grow i'm not explaining it well it seemed to come from somewhere deep inside me deeper than the part that sees pictures of gold and amber palaces deeper than fears and tears it was shapeless but you could just hold on to it or just let it hold on to you. What do you think she's pointing at there? Yeah, so I'm not going to give you a super satisfying answer because I I believe that's the point Lewis is trying to make here is it's something so much more than we can even imagine. She's already had a pretty beautiful theology of longing. And what she's saying here is it was so much deeper than that. And so even what we thought was already beautiful, this is more than that because she goes deeper than the part that sees pictures of gold and amber palaces. And so that's referencing what she thought was that depth of that longing. And now she's going, wow, it was even more than I thought. And so I think to myself, I'm going to hopefully get to heaven. And I had this longing for communion with God. And I already have a beautiful picture of what that's going to look like. And I'm going to get there and it's going to be like mind blown. And it's going to be so much more. And you just can't explain it. You could hold on to it, but maybe it holds on to you. Yeah. St. Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear heard what God has in store for those who love him. I love that verse. Hmm. Well, thankfully, things start cheering up. The weather changes. Uh, the wind comes, and with it comes the rain. And Psyche then says that she sees him, the god of the wind, the west wind himself, which I'm assuming we're meant to assume is also Ungit's son. And she says she gets a glimpse of him, but just in the way that you glimpse lightning. And when she's trying to describe what he looked like to Orwell, she compares it to comparing healthy people and lepers, which again just brought me back to the great divorce. It's the difference between the ghosts and the substantial people, the, the, the spirits. Yeah, that was a big part for her here. She, t- she talked about how she wasn't glad or afraid, but just felt ashamed. Ashamed of being mortal. Yes, in looking like a mortal. And that's, that's, I put that in my notes as well when I was reading this. I thought of the great divorce, that feeling of being insubstantial, that feeling of being empty, that feeling of being exposed. And we've felt that on a small level. Have you ever walked into a place where no one knows you in your false self? They don't really know your false self. That usually gives you the confidence and you just feel like nothing. And you almost feel a bit of a shame come over you. And I just imagine that magnified times 10. I think of it more 
like when I go to an event and I'm underdressed, everybody else looks all fancy and I turned up in shorts and flip flops. <laughs> and actually, as I was reading this, it reminded me of a section in Letters to Malcolm where Lewis is talking about purgatory and he characterizes it in those kinds of words about the, the, the person landing on the shores of heaven and they say, come in, nobody cares. And he says, I'd actually prefer to be washed and cleaned first. Mm, I like that. And that's sort of what ends up happening because uh, the god carries Psyche away to his palace and she describes his arms as burning, but somehow they don't hurt. Which again made me think of the incident with the angel and the ghost with the lizard on his shoulder. Although for him, it definitely did hurt. But then we come to the crunch. Oral thinks that Psyche was dreaming, but Psyche asks a really important question. If I was dreaming, how did I escape? I'm not going to say much here because she uses that same wisdom a little bit later when her and Orwa are going back and forth and Orwa is trying to convince her this is all fake. She asks a similar question and I can't wait to address it there. That's just brilliant. She's smart. And she returns to the idea of falling asleep and waking up. She describes her earlier life as being like the dream. This is the reality. But now we get to see the part where Psyche talks about the Amber Palace. She's been waiting for this moment. We've been hearing about the gold and Amber Palace since the beginning, the longing. And she finally lands there after being swept away. And she says it was better than anything that she could have ever imagined. And she hears voices saying, enter your house, Psyche, the bride of the god. And other voices welcome her. <laughs> and this made me think of Disney's The Beauty and the Beast. Be our guest, be our guest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you give me a little more of that, David? No, I can't. That's it. All right. And they give us food and she's bathed and then brought to a feast. And again, it was really hard not to think about baptism and Holy Communion. And these do appear to have had something to do with her transformation. And then she says that the God came to her in the night. But Oral just can't, can't grasp this. She, she plays the role of doubting Thomas. She wants proof. And so she says that she wants to see this palace. And she asks, is it far? And that's when Psyche gives the crushing response. But this is it, Orwell. It is here. You're standing on the steps of the great gate. The one thing I want to say from this scene that I think is important to point out is when Psyche, Psyche mentions that there was a point when she's in here that she was, she, a fear came over her that this was all a mockery. And the reason I wanted to point this out was because Psyche's not perfect either. We've been having, I've been bringing up this question a lot. Is this Orwell's fault? How much free will choice did she have? And she, when she experiences joy, she pushes it away out of fear and shame, as we talked about last time. Psyche actually had the same temptation here to push it away. She thought that this was all a mockery and going to be pulled away. But the difference is she, honestly, she had faith. She trusts, as we've talked about in our YouTube videos before, faith is holding on into the light, what you once knew in the darkness. She trusts that this is real. Other way around. <laughs> Other way, holding on into darkness, what you once knew true in the light. And I, I, I thought that here because Psyche, her, her emotions were deceiving her. She was afraid this was a mockery and all false, but yet she didn't let her give in to that. Good point. And that's where chapter 10 ends. So this is what happens in chapter 11. After an awkward silence, Psyche and Orwell begin to argue. It becomes clear that the two sisters have been experiencing very different realities. What Psyche gave as wine and honey cakes Orwell received as berries and water. Psyche remembers that her husband said that Orwell might not be able to see things clearly. She says that she will beg for his help, but Orwell is enraged. It begins to rain. When Orwell offers Psyche her cloak, she reminds her that they are indoors. Orwell sees this moment as a decision point, and she rejects what Psyche is saying, thinking that she is mad. She tries to force her sister to leave, but Psyche is too strong. As sunset approaches, Orwell returns to the other side of the stream, but is bidden to return again soon. It's just getting good. <laughs> I really liked the way he set up this chapter, because while we left it in the previous chapter, they've been sitting in Heather uh, and holding each other's hands, all four hands holding one another. And we begin this chapter with a separation that's happened between them. There's been a division they're no longer sitting. They're no longer holding hands. There's actually several feet between the two of them. Something has come between them. And this is what really ticks Orwell off. This is why she blames the gods. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. Sorry, I don't have more to say. That's yeah, okay. 
<laughs> Listeners, it's funny watching David's face through Skype. Got anything else? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Well, one thing I was going to say is that, so Oral is thinking that Psyche's gone crazy, but she also reveals that she doesn't even want it to be true. And I mean, if this is true, this is something amazing and surely she would want it. But Oral writes that my whole heart leaped to shut the door against something monstrously amiss, not to be endured and to keep it shut. And then she says, we must go away at once. This is a terrible place. And Psyche encourages her to touch the walls if she can't see them, at least touch them. But Orwell refuses. And that really annoyed me because I, I, I wanted to know what would happen if Psyche tried to put Orwell's hand on a wall. Would her hand just go through it? What, what would that be like? I would imagine it would have gone through it because she handed her a chalice and it wasn't a chalice. It was Psyche's hands. But obviously in Psyche's hands, there was a chalice and she didn't feel that. I would imagine she wouldn't have felt it. Mm, yeah, seems, seems like a good guess. And rain falls on her. So clearly it wasn't keeping the rain out from her. <laughs> so True. It ain't working for her. <laughs> well, all, no, we, only, we don't know Oral's testimony is that rain fell on her. We don't know if it did. True. Oral, <laughs> you can tell when somebody, they're, they're losing an argument because they just try and take over in terms of physicality. So Oral tries to manhandle Psyche, but finds out that she's too big and too strong. And again, this reminded me of the Great Divorce. It actually also reminded me of the Chronicles of Narnia. When the children return, remember in Prince Caspian, they start getting their strength back. They become more than mere children. And the same is true for Psyche. She's becoming stronger, apparently. And this is where they then have a dispute over the food and drink which Psyche gave her. Psyche says that they were honey cakes and, a, and wine in a cup. But Oral says, no, they were berries and water in your own hands. And... This really reminded me, so I, it was very reminiscent of something that happens at the end of the last battle with the dwarves. I would say more, but I know you haven't read it. So listeners, just think with me, the dwarves and what happens with them. <laughs> and now Matt is staring at me blankly. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, you can ruin it for me, David. I don't care. No, we'll get there. We'll get there. A few more seasons. And Psyche is really sad and Orwell writes that she struck her breast with a clenched fist as mourners do. And Orwell says that she's almost convinced by Psyche's reaction. And she goes on to say that later in her life, she would have nightmares that related to this incident. She said that she would uh, dream again and again that she'd be in some well-known place. And everything she saw was different from what she touched. So she put a hand on a table. She would feel warm hair instead of wood. And the corner of the table would shoot out a hot, wet tongue to lick her. She's basically having a nightmare where what she's seeing and the reality that's there are two different things. Yeah, that would be pretty scary. Have you seen Spider-Man, the Far From Home? Yes, it's in my notes. Far From Home. I have exactly that note. Yeah, when Mysterio is making him see illusions and he's completely oblivious to the world that's around him. And the other image I had actually was if you've ever gone to stay with some friends and you go and get a drink in the middle of the night so you're walking around a dark house that's unfamiliar, you feel utterly disoriented. You're not quite sure what you, you know, if you're about to walk into something. Well, I get that to much more extremes. I wake up with night terrors in new places because I'm just so disoriented. My brain even knows, like in the middle of the night, subconsciously, where am I? Uh-oh. This doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel right. And this is where Orwell realizes the wedge that's been drawn between her and her sister. And this was your quote of the week where she talked about the world being broken into pieces and she and Psyche weren't on the same piece. And I think this is an answer to a quote that we skipped over in the beginning of this chapter where she says, and now we are coming to the part of my history on which my charge against the gods chiefly rests. I think this quote is more or less the answer to that. She's just so frustrated that they built this distance, such a hopeless distance between her and the love of her life, really, Psyche, her entire identity. And she even says they had stolen her, which shows that Arwell has some possession over Psyche. Yes. She, we... wants, she wants Psyche for herself. And she even says that Psyche is worthy of the gods, but she doesn't care. She wants her for herself regardless. Well, this was interesting because I, she asks, was Psyche not worthy of the gods at this point right here? Because she thought it for a moment and then quickly threw it out is what it said. And I, and I put in my notes, like, what did you make of that? 
her saying is psyche not worthy of the gods. Basically, that psyche is so great. Of course, that's where she should be. She should be among the gods. She should have this great blessing. So she's worthy of it, but Orwell doesn't want her to have it because that means that she has to leave Orwell. Because for Orwell, it's binary. It's, a, it's an either or. Either psyche is with me or she's in this place. Either she's with me and she loves me or she's not with me. And that means that she hates me somehow. It's the mother from The Great Divorce. She wants her son with her, regardless of the terms. Yes. See, this is so much like the mother from The Great Divorce. Now, Psyche says that she'll implore her husband, that he will help her to be able to see. And she actually even alludes to the fact that her husband organized this meeting, which I'm sure that didn't cheer up Orwell at all either. And this constant reference to her husband really irritates Orwell. She says... Uh, it was like the way young wives talk. Now, I don't know about young wives, but I do know, I've known a couple of girls who, when they get a boyfriend, every other word will be, well, my boyfriend says this, well, my boyfriend does that. <laughs> so in the face of all of this, Orwell returns to her theory that Psyche's mad, and she demands evidence to substantiate her story. She says, where's this god? Where is this palace? Nowhere, in your fancy. Where is he? Show him to me. What is he like? And Psyche reveals that she hasn't yet really seen his face as he comes in the darkness. Which I gotta admit, kind of creepy. But this is that point that I was talking about earlier. The genius of Psyche. Because she's trying to, she's trying to help Orwell get to the truth here. And she made a couple comments here. But the first one was very much like the, is it the professor in Narnia that says, has Lucy been known to lie? She goes, Orwell, have I ever lied to you? And so then Orwell quickly says, not intentionally, but this could be delusion. And then Psyche's response was brilliant. If it's all lies, how did I live this long? Does she look like, she asked, do I look like I'm mad or delusional? Because if she was, that means she has not been nourished this whole time. And this has been a stretch of a period. Her arms should be shriveling up because if she was mad or delusional, she probably wasn't feeding well. And so she looks like she is actually radiant. And Orwell has a hard time denying that. She's like, yeah, but she does look radiant and beautiful and something seems off. I'd lie if I could. <laughs> That's a pretty, to me, that would be very convincing. I don't think the other explanation can explain that. Well, it's basically Lewis's trilemma, lunatic liar or lord. It's the same trilemma that, as you mentioned, was related to Lucy in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. She doesn't seem crazy. She doesn't lie. Shouldn't we assume that what she's saying is true? How did I get it that far? I got it close to that. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that lun lunatic liar lord. And Psyche says again that her husband will help Orwell to see, but she says she didn't want it. She hates it. Hate it, hate it, hate it. And she keeps saying of Psyche, you loved me. Come back to me. She's, she's, it's almost, she's having a very visceral reaction to feeling the distance that's growing between them. Yeah, she's losing Psyche. Remember how she said the gods took away from her Psyche three times? This is like the fourth time. Yeah. <laughs> how could it get any worse? And it did. Yeah. And again, she lets it slip that with for her, it's an either or. She asks, is it nothing to you at all that you're leaving me, going into all that, turning your back on our love? Because in Orwell's mind, her love must be number one, not any other's. And it's interesting because Psyche's repeated refrain is that I'm now a wife, that she has other duties, other responsibilities, other allegiances in her life. I think to Oral, that's utterly unacceptable. It would have been unacceptable if she had just married some other king. The fact that it's a god, it just makes it all even worse. And to try to bring this to, as a listener and an us, to something that this could apply to our own lives, this isn't far-fetched. I think of Sheldon Van Auken in A Severe Mercy, which is an incredible book. I recommend it. He met Lewis. There's letters to Lewis. That's why I bring this up. And there was a point when they went from atheism to Christianity, and he noticed his wife loved the Lord more than she loved him. And in the beginning, when they were atheists, it was all about them, an all-consuming love of each other. And that was really hard for him. And... I'm actually not going to say any more because the end of the book starts revealing some stuff about maybe why that was the case and what God did about that. But that's a very real thing. If if you're if you're 
you, if your spouse or someone you love is falling in love with the Lord or a friend of yours is, you feel like you're losing them to God. That's hard. Yeah. And there's yet another line that Psyche says that made me think of the Great Divorce. She says, no, no, Maya, I can't go back to you. How could I? You must come to me. Do you remember the bit in The Great Divorce with Sarah Smith when she's talking to her husband, the tragedian? She says, here is joy that cannot be shaken. Our light can swallow up your darkness, but your darkness cannot now infect our light. No, no, no. Come to us. We will not go to you. Can you really have thought that love and joy would always be at the mercy of frowns and sighs? So Lewis isn't completely original. He takes from his other works. He copied himself. <laughs> he's, cop- he's copying from the best sources himself. <laughs> and then here is the uh, final blow. It begins to rain. Orwell offers her sister her cloak, but Psyche points out that it's not needed since she's inside her palace. And with this, Orwell just concludes it's madness. I thought this was interesting, though, because she said that as the pleading continued, this was a very decisive moment for Orwell, and she thought the gods would speak to her, and then they didn't, and it rained. And my first thought was, isn't that them speaking? Because this was all about rain. If they are real, it would rain. That's like God slapping Orwell across the head. She was literally prepared for this. I'm like, how <laughs> are you missing this right now, Orwell? Ugh. So I, I, I believe she just misses it. I don't, I don't sympathize with her as much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> She's missing it. She's losing it. Ugh. And she says the horrible line, I learned then how one can hate those one loves. Mm. Or she learned how when love becomes a god, it becomes a demon. Wow. And Orwell tries to physically force her again, but Psyche's just too strong. And Psyche tells her sister that sunset is coming and that she should leave, but invites her to come back as soon as she can. And she mysteriously says she doesn't think the king's going to be much hindrance in the next few days. She doesn't explain why she thinks that, but she says that she should come back. And Orwell crosses the stream, but then starts begging Psyche to come with her, saying they could become beggar women and go anywhere. And Psyche responds, I'm not my own. You forget, sister, that I'm a wife. Yet always yours too. Now, I just think Orwell just doesn't believe that. She doesn't think that's possible. Oh, if you knew, you'd be happy. Orwell, don't look so sad. All will be well. All will be better than you can dream of. Come again soon. Another example of Orwell being helped. So you've been talking about this either or. Psyche just told her it's not just either or. Yours too. But then the other thing, let's pay attention to if this prediction of the king comes true. Shouldn't Orwell be thinking to herself, huh, how did Psyche know that? Psyche, if she was not with the gods, would not know that. If Psyche was with the gods, she might actually have that information. So if it's true, another example where Orwell just misses it. Yeah. Seeing versus perceiving. She is seeing and seeing nothing. But Lewis says elsewhere that what you... What you see depends on very much the kind of person you are and from where you're standing. And Orwell has demonstrated throughout these two chapters that she doesn't want to believe. Mm -hmm. She even says this would change everything, everything I've ever believed. Doesn't Jesus also say you can't give pearls to pigs? Do not cast your pearls before swine. There we go. But I don't think Psyche's swine. (laughs) I don't need. I was actually thinking Orwell. But I think she's blind. Yeah. What I've heard people use that for is the gem of the gospel when you're telling people who just don't want to receive it don't it, it's just not going to work i think it's a bit of a stretch but i've heard people use that verse that way in the early church they typically use that verse in reference to the eucharist huh that would make sense that was why the early church had a closed communion so that only those who could receive as justin martyr says those who believe as we do who have been washed with the water of rebirth and living as christ is enjoined wow was not expecting that Well, there you go. I keep giving. (laughs) I will keep receiving, David. (laughs) I will not forebode this joy of your wisdom. Well, ladies and gentlemen, next week we'll be reading chapters 12 and 13. And as a reminder, guys, with the competition, you guys are doing fantastic. Clearly, you didn't hear the first time we did it, but you did the second time because we got a big influx after this last episode. And we've had uh, many of you write reviews and email us. So thank you for that. This will be the last reminder of that. By the time... The next episode comes, or the the next week when it's released, we'll have selected it. We might not say it on it because we're recording that ahead of time. But 
between now when this is released on today is a Tuesday it'll be and the next Tuesday is your last chance and then after that I will select two or three of you guys and send stuff directly to you that was a very complicated way of saying submit your review soon because we're going to stop the competition <laughs> <laughs> and then for those who are just hearing this submit your review on whatever app you use and then go to our website and email us there's a contact form saying you did and here was the they usually ask for a fake name when you do a review here's the name so when we select it we can email you and then join us next week when we're going to be going further up and further in cheers cheers <laughs>